from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and yours are safe, sheltering in place in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to greeting you back in our yacht club just as soon as conditions permit. So I was born in San Francisco, but I was a first generation San Franciscan. And our guest today is a fifth generation San Franciscan. In fact, he'll blush when he hears this, but I've been hearing his name since I was a little newspaper boy in San Francisco. I want to welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, a bit of a hero of mine, Carl Milty. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. How are you? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be around the St. Francis and especially to the uh, Yachting Luncheon. As Ron said, I was born and raised in San Francisco, and uh, I've lived here most of my life. I've seen the city change and shift and change again. Like a lot of San Francisco people, we sometimes look back and wonder what it was like in the city of another time, what it was like in the city of another day. Was there a sort of golden age of San Francisco? You know, a lot of people think that San Francisco of the 1950s was that, that time. They say, hey, look, we had four newspapers. We had here at Tubman, Oakland. People dressed up to go downtown to get a good meal for very little money. It was a smaller city. There were 100,000 fewer people than there are now. And besides, all of us were a lot younger and smarter and better looking back then. Tell me about growing up in Potrero Hill and how your whole newspaper career started. Potrero Hill was, uh, was affordable. My mother and father bought a house on 25th Street for $2,240 in, uh, I think, 1940. And so I'm up there and uh, standing in front of the house like a nice little boy on a day in November. And over the top of the hill on 25th Street, over the top of the hill comes his car, a little sedan, and it was a guy, and he rolled the window down, and the back of his car is full of old newspapers or something. And he says, hey, kid, you want to make some money delivering papers? And I says, yeah, sure, mister. And it was the San Francisco News. and I started delivering the paper, and then I spent most of my time reading it before delivering it. And I kind of drifted into working for a newspaper. My original idea was to become a world-famous lawyer or something like that. So you know. went to work for the news? Was that was that before it was the news called Bulletin? Oh, the, the call Bulletin was our rival. There were four papers that chronicled the Examiner, the San Francisco News, and the call Bulletin. So I worked for the San Francisco News, or I delivered the San Francisco News, yes. But then there was consolidation, like in all things in business. Uh, pretty yeah. soon the news and the call bulletin merged because I was a newsboy. I, I delivered the news call bulletin. The San Francisco News and the call bulletin merged in, a, I think it was 1959. Then it was a further consolidation in 1965 when the Examiner and Chronicle merged all its non-editorial functions. And the Examiner stopped being a morning paper it became an afternoon paper. When I was a high school kid, there were buddies of mine who were who still were newspaper guys. One guy had a little sports car, was actually a, 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 a Austin Healy Mini, and he had used a can opener and stuff to cut off the top of it. And two of us would be in the back seat, folding and tossing and folding and tossing, drove right. all around, you know, by the uh, Granada Theater off of Ocean Avenue. And the, and this guy was yeah. he had like three routes, and he could use this car to deliver with a couple of his buddies, and we'd come fly around corners and be throwing you know and and uh, over this it's got to get onto this porch it's got to get to the right of the door etc did you do it with a car or did you do your no 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 if i were entrepreneurial like you and the kid in the car i would have amounted to something <laughs> i i got i had a they gave you a thing to put around your shoulder or whatever it was and i uh, hoofed it i walked around a patrol hill delivering a paper <laughs> so you didn't use a bike, you used it, you were a hoofer. Your no bike is patrol hill, it was, it was steep, you don't ride any bike up there. So you started delivering newspapers, when did you start writing for newspapers? What was your first writing job for a newspaper? My uh, first write, well, I, I used to read the paper, I, used to, I had my own newspaper, which I put out, and I remember the headline said, Daddy hit my car. That's pretty serious. <laughs> you know, my father was hit by a car, ended up in a hospital, and man, he almost lost his leg, and Okay, so now when you said you had your own newspaper, you mean you wrote your own newspaper. Is that what you mean? I, yeah, I produced it. I was the editor, publisher. I was the printer. I wrote it out. Later, I 
I got a typewriter and I typed it out. The newspaper was that, uh, well, we had a, in the backyard, we also had an imaginary country. It was called Black Hawk. I forget quite why, but it was Black Hawk. That was our imaginary country. And this was the official organ of this imaginary country. I was the president and my brother was the vice president until there was a kind of a military coup. That is to say, he got bigger than me. We had a big fight and he won. <laughs> was he a younger brother than you that got bigger than you? Yeah, yeah. It was a that happened to me. Wait a minute. There must be something in the water. The same thing happened to me. My little brother, Rick, got bigger than me. By the time I was about six, he got taller than I was. I didn't catch up with him until high school. It was, it was, it took him a while. He's still taller than me. He, he's still younger, but he's still paying a neck, you know? <laughs> I remind him about that. And he, uh, he claims that I was a dictator or some other thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you got your own newspaper. Yeah, and newspaper, yeah. And you type it in a typewriter. First, I drew it by hand, you know, like an artist or something, a computer artist. I had uh, pictures that I made, and uh, usually the news had to do with whatever pictures I, I had, and you know, I put them in only if it was important, like when a president died or something. <laughs> Other than that, it was just local news. And what would you do with the newspaper that you wrote and drew? I distributed it. I sold it to my father. It was a I had limited edition. You know, it was, <laughs> think of the monks in Ireland carping their, you know, copying stuff. Our younger viewers might have a hard time imagining back in those days, copying machines were very rare. Nobody yeah. had a copier at home. Nobody had a copier at home. Everybody's got a copy at their house nowadays. But in those days, nobody did. And most people didn't have, only educated people had typewriters at home, in fact, you know. We weren't exactly educated. We did have a typewriter. My father never finished high school. I was the first one of my family to ever finish high school even. So after I got graduated from high school, I decided it was time to quit delivering newspapers and actually have to go get a job. <laughs> it was very gently put to me, look, kid, even feeding you these 17 years, it's about time you earned some money. I got a job working for the Southern Pacific in the office. And one summer working in a downtown office is enough to convince me that... Uh, I better go to college. So I went to City College for two years. And I, work, I, I did work on a school newspaper there, a guardsman, but I worked on a literary magazine called The Forum. It was a very nice tweedy English teacher, convinced me that I was a literate. So you work in the SP for a while, then how does it happen that you get your first job in a newspaper company writing? Well, I was, after I went to, graduated from City College, I switched to the University of San Francisco. And I had been interested in newspapers. You know, I read them or when before I delivered them. I always kind of liked them. I particularly liked the Chronicle. I read every word, I copied their style. And so when I went to USF, I decided I wanted to work on a school paper, which is called the Foghorn. So I went in there and says, hey, Mr. Editor or whatever you are, I'd like to work on your paper. And he said, oh yeah, okay, kid. Do this, do that. And I did the usual stuff. I wrote little stories about, you know, registration or summer school or little junky stories like that. I went in there one day and they said, we got enough of this stuff. We're going to transfer you to the sport page. I said, the sports page? I don't know anything about sports. And they said, yeah, you want to work for the Foghorn or not? You want to work for the Foghorn and work for sports? If you don't want to work for the Foghorn, see ya. <laughs> Kind of a typical newspaper view. I remember the first game I went to, and I wasn't covering it, but I was trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Is USF playing Cal at the Kizar Pavilion in 1953, and it was the debut of, of Bill Russell. And Cal was ranked basketball team was ranked at I think tenth of the nation, and they had all American center named McKean, Bob McKean, and a. a a near all American guard named Matheny, whose first name I can't remember. And first shot McKean took, Russell knocked it into the rafters. He was a defensive. Ah! He was this big, huge, tough guy. And we had a guard named Casey Jones, too. And we did, we did beat Cal by some giant score. And that team didn't do that well. But the next year we came back, and now Russell's a junior, not a sophomore. I remember going to see the coach. I said, hey, coach. You lost to UCLA. Why is that? I thought we, you know, we were playing on the road against UCLA. We were expected to lose. And he was mad as hell. He said, we're, we shouldn't have lost to UCLA. We shouldn't have? No. They, those rats, they, they, they cheated us or something. Well, we're not going to forget that. We're not going to lose any more games. 
And I was so amazed. He said, we're not going to lose any more games. I was so amazed. I didn't even write that. And we didn't lose any more games for like 60 straight games. So that was, wasn't John Wooden the coach at UCLA in those days? Yes, it was, yeah. Now he's gone down as being the original iconic and brilliant coach. So you were there at these pretty historic moments where USF goes to be the greatest basketball team in the nation and one of the greatest in history. Yeah. It generates Bill Russell, one of the greatest defensive players, in fact, basketball players in all of history. So do you realize at the time that you're at this momentous figure? Were you just a kid from Petrero Hill, Brighton? I was a kid from Petrero Hill with the ambitious ideas to chronicle all this great stuff. I, we knew right away that these guys really were pretty special. Now, it wasn't a surprise. We beat Oregon State like 51 to 30 or some horrible thing like that. It's cow pals. <laughs> I mean, that, that was the beginning of our red streak. We would just beat everybody. So you start as a sports guy. So when do you evolve from a sports writer to uh, other responsibilities in the newspaper? What year? After we won our national championship and I graduated from college in 1955, I got this letter in the mail and it was from the president of the United States. It said, to Carl W. Nolte, greeting your friends and neighbors, of draft board 6109 or someplace, Mission Street, have selected you. And it said, you are directed to report to, I think, Vanis, someplace of Vanis Avenue for a physical. And if you pass the physical, and if you will be inducted into the armed forces of the United States on such and such a date, September, uh, I remember vividly, September 16th, 1955. And I, I passed the exa physical examination, raised my right hand like that took the one step forward. I was inducted into the armed forces of the United States. I remember <laughs> saluting a general with my left hand once. <laughs> so you took a little hiatus from your newspaper career. Well, I didn't even have a newspaper career. I was going to be a famous lawyer, like the famous lawyers you see at the St. Francis. <laughs> but I had a slight detour to go serve our country in the armed forces in the Cold War, right? Yeah. So where'd you go? Did you go to Korea? Where'd you go? First, I went to Fort Ord, Fort Ord University. And then I went to uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia, where they said, just a, just the thing you need to be is a radio teletype operator, radio teletype operator. And you also have to learn Morse code. You have to be able to copy, as we say, 16 words a minute Morse code. Did that, did that, that, did that, did that, that, you right. still, can you do it? You still read Morse? With it, with it, with some difficulty. I'm a bit rusty on Morse, I'm Morse yeah. After that, they uh, said, okay, you get to go to, We've assigned you to a fine job in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Where they're not, well, unfortunately, we have too many radio operators. So, how'd you like to drive a Jeep? <laughs> yes, sir, said I. I drive a Jeep like hell. I'll drive my Jeep. And we're going to drive a Jeep around this is Fort Benning Infantry Base, an airborne base. So, I was driving a Jeep, a facility called Sand Hill, where there were these infantrymen. They seemed to spend their time eating dust and practicing shooting at people. And I thought, Man, I've never got anything to do with the infantry if I could ever figure out how to get out of it. But then uh, I had enough time in service that uh, I was drafted again, this time to go to the Far East. So I went on a troop ship from, I was reassigned. I went on a troop ship from Seattle to Korea. I was in Korea for 13 months. But I had let the, uh, those in charge of everything uh, make sure they knew that I had and was an ambitious guy and not some goddamn radio operator type and uh, or certainly no infantry men. We had, a, we had rifles, of course, but uh, I was going to go to law school. So that I became a paralegal. I was an enlisted. I was an enlisted soldier. I did not take ROTC. So I wasn't an officer. As a paralegal and it, we had some uh, disciplinary problems involving drinking and no drugs, drinking and chasing women and stuff like that usual soldier stuff. <laughs> so I, I did that. Okay, so now how do you get from, now you're a GI. I get out of the Army. So I get out of the Army, right? After a due period of time, two years out of the Army, I come back and I'm at USF and they have done two national championships and gotten a Final Four for the, a third national championship, which they didn't win because the team ran into Will Chamberlain was playing for Kansas. The guy who was the PR representative of the public information officer, athletic news director for the team, had quit. He wanted to go to law school. 
For he's which team now? The athletic director of what, what school? USF, USF team. Okay. He says, uh, hey, this guy quit. He's going to law school and become a famous lawyer. And he did. I see him. He is a famous lawyer. I see him around once in a while. He wears a three-piece suit and everything. And I said, how would you like to take this job and be our PR guy? I said, well, I was going to go to law school. But then I thought about it for 36 seconds and think, you know, that's a lot of work going to law school. I was going to go to Hastings. But let me just uh, try this out for a while and see what happens. <laughs> Another fatal this, is, this is 57, what year? Uh, 1957, I think. Okay. So you don't go to Hastings, where my daughter was editor-in-chief of the Law Journal. Veronica, my daughter, Veronica, went to Hastings and became number one kid at that school. So you chose differently. My father went to school with a federal judge. He wrote a letter to Hastings saying, that to take this kid, he's smart. But I didn't do it. Oh, I'll just try this for a year. Well... How long ago was that? So that was that was 64 years ago. You you made that kind of branch decision. You decided not to be a lawyer to become a writer. So you become first a PR guy for the USF athletic department or the school itself. For the athletic department, but then after a few, after a year or two, the regular we had a regular PR guy, a job now handled, handled by the way, by vice presidents and all kinds of directors of external affairs and the usual thing. So I did that too. I became it for the whole school. I remember I got a big story in Life Magazine and everything. You did? You got a story in Life Magazine about USF basketball? Not basketball, but USF uh, uh, professor who taught foreign languages. I got another one in about a, in a chronicle, page one story about a professor I found who was a world leading expert on flat footed flies. <laughs> Flat-footed flies. Forget dog bites man for the newspaper. You got flat-footed flies on the front page. Yeah, and, and, and the good old Dr. Kessler was a serious man, and he was the world's leading expert on flat-footed flies, as you well know. <laughs> flies congregate around campfires. And so his summer, when he wasn't teaching, his summer was going up camping in Northern and California and Oregon watching carefully around the campfire at dusk for flat-footed flies, which he would capture, bring back, and write papers about. So I got David Perlman to write about this guy, and I, poor old Dr. Kessel went along with that. And the photographer made Dr. Kessel have a kind of fly net creeping through the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> thrown out of the. They said, what kind of story is that, Carl? We want stories about what a great place this is. You're writing stories about, I heard the paper write stories about professors with teaching people and flat-footed flies. What the hell is this? I said, oh, I you spelled the name right, didn't they? <laughs> okay, so how do you break in? How do you how do you get out of right, so I'm, a, I'm in a I'm in a PR business, right? I'm making lots of contacts with sports writers, TV people like Lon Simmons and people like that, and Bob Fouts, who are broadcasting our games or on or on sports shows on on the radio and television. So I know all these people. I know the sports writers at the Chronicle, the Examiner, the News Call Bullet when you delivered it, city side reporters, I knew editors, I knew all these guys. So one day I, I'm, I'm becoming uh, disillusioned with being in public relations because you have to be positive and put a positive spin on everything. And if somebody gave us a great lot of money, why, I'd write a story about what a great American this guy was. And, uh, <laughs> if the sheriff who drank quite a lot, was in charge of the alumni banquet. I would write, what a, what a genius and great statesman this guy was. <laughs> said, you know, maybe this isn't what I really want to do. So I used my contacts kind of. Uh, one copy editor named George Randall, who, who, who was working at the Chronicle at a copy desk. I knew him because I cultivated anybody that looked like to work for the paper, I'd talk to him. He says, hey, I, we got a problem at the paper. We can't find anybody to do a work a summer. You want to work a summer job? You know anybody who wants to work for Chronicle of Summer on the copy desk, writing headlines? Oh, yeah, how about me? So I go down there and uh, I, I, I became a copy editor. I was not sure exactly what a copy editor was. They write headlines and edit stories, you know. So I went down to a corner store and bought a book on journalism and read it. I was able to convince the people in charge of the Chronicle that I knew how to, what I was doing. And uh, I, at that time, and unlike now, I was a fast learner. So I learned how to write headlines and edit stories. 
And I was pretty good at it. We had, at that time, the Chronicle was having a circulation war for domination with the examiner. We had banner headlines every day, no matter what. So I was pretty good at writing these big, they were 96 point type, this big, you know, really big type. Tell somebody just so they know, a copy editor, tell, you come to work and what do you do all day long? Well, I come, we don't work, we don't work, we work nights. Come in at three o'clock if you were lucky, midnight if you at five o'clock if you weren't. That was so long ago, we edited the copy, that is the stories, with a pencil. So you take the story and, and edit it. You know, an editing process is you make things better the way you do when you do this programs. Yeah. You try to make things better. And so you who would you give it off to after you finished editing it? Who would it go to? Would it get set in type right then and there or what? The paper in those dark days was set by a limp type. And uh, they sent the copy to the composing room, or we used to call it the decomposing room because we had big problems with the, the technology at all times at the paper. I mean, God damn, it was terrible. And we we're always late in, you know, on the edition where we late five minutes. We used to put out five editions a day. We were hoping uh, that I get chewed out if I missed an edition sometimes. Sometimes I got to be uh, the uh, person in the composing room trying to get the printers to do what they're supposed to do and make, make a, if I missed an edition, I remember the editor called me over and said, look, you missed the 1015. We said, we used to have street sales on Market Street because people went to the movies, right? Yeah. People went to the movies on Market, Market Street was all lit up. Neon signs, there's movies all over the place. Yeah. Started, people are walking home from the movies or walking home from dinner and we're trying to sell them a paper and, and I want that paper out there. You missed that edition, we're going to miss those people. They're not coming back again. So don't do it again. Yes, sir. Okay. So you go to work at 3 p.m. And it's 6 p.m. that day. The newspaper's on the street. Yeah. Of course, they did a lot of preliminary work first. You know, we just. Yeah. We just, so you'd be the last guy and you'd throw a headline together. I and the last out. guy, but yeah. The Chronicle was a morning paper at this time? Sir, sure. Yeah, it's always been a morning paper. Yeah. And so, yeah. So in other words, you get to work at three. When the first edition comes out at 6 p.m., then okay. a couple more editions. Final comes out at 11, a, 11 p.m. And that's the same paper that gets delivered for morning delivery the next morning. It, yeah, yeah. Then there was a, another one. They, the last edition we could do anything with was 1.30 a.m. So if you okay. had a late shift, you had to be there. Make sure this paper was page proof of what it's supposed to look like. Make sure there was no big mistakes and it was okay. And if it was, you'd say... Sometimes the guy would say, it's a thing of beauty, which meant print it. After my machinations to become managing editor or be somebody <laughs> fell through, uh, I decided that I, was, that I wasn't paid enough and I didn't want to do this. I was an assistant city editor, an assistant city editor. And they said, you got to pay me some more money or else. He said, or else what? <laughs> he said, okay, so you're a reporter. Usually <laughs> reporters... The reporters who work their way up to editors. I worked my way from editor to reporters. I did it backwards. Tell us about this picture right here. Looking that down picture, California. That picture's California Street, uh, opposite Old St. Mary's Church, California Street in the 1950s. You see the cable car. You see all the nice parking places. You see a skyline of San Francisco. It's very much different than what you see now, than what we have now. Right, the Rust Building, that tall, that tall uh, gold-colored building, that would be the Rust Building over there to the right? Yeah, that would be the Rust Building. The Rust Building was, uh, I think, 24 stories high. Was that it? Or 32 or something like that? It was the tallest building on the West Coast, wasn't it? The tallest building for a long time on the West Coast. It was built in 1924, which is a, or 27. That was a big year for, a boom year for San Francisco. And after that, after the Rust Building was completed, and the telephone building in the 1920s, there were no more big buildings until the 50s. San Francisco had a lot of uh, reputation, even back then, for looks and charm. There were lots of movies made in San Francisco. And typical was the musical Pal Joey. It had Frank Sinatra, Rita Hayworth, and Kim Novak, and it was set in San Francisco. For those people who are too young to know, he just <laughs> named the rock star movie stars from the 1950s. Our younger audience might say, I've heard of Frank Sinatra, but what about these other folks? Well, those are all big names in showbiz back in those 50s. Yeah, and, you know, Rita Hayward was the film star of the, of the era, you'd say. Kim Novak was a rising film star. She had made Picnic, and later that year she made Vertigo in San Francisco. 
Frank Sinatra was a big pal of Herb Cain. I was in the city all the time, mostly at uh, Broadway and North Beach at El Matador. Kim Novak later came back. My wife arranged a big event at the Old Mint celebrating San Francisco in the movies and invited Kim Novak. Kim Novak came to this event. This is about four or five years ago. And she was utterly and completely charming. For a movie star, she was really polite and nice. I've seen TV guys who do the 11 o'clock news and were puffed up than Kim Novak. So she came and gave a talk and the mayor came, Willie Brown came, everybody came. And so after that, we said to Kim Novak, hey, you wanna go have a drink with us? What a thought, have taken Kim Novak out for a drink? And she said, sure. So myself and some other people took her to uh, the Tosca at North Beach and bought her a drink. Wonderful. Said, wow. <laughs> what year was this, Carl? What year is this? Uh, what, six or seven years ago. Wonderful. So this is like 2013, 14, something like that. Yeah, I think so. Great. Yeah. She Great. was so nice. So <laughs> here's a little look at the city at that time. Opening to that movie, Pal Joey, shows a city that doesn't exist anymore. A city where you came by steam train into the Oakland Pier, the Oakland Bowl, got on a ferry boat, an old time ferry boat, rode across the bay. The other passengers you'll notice were dressed to the nines. There were army officers and Navy officers and the skyline of San Francisco was a bit like looking at your old high school graduation picture. It's recognizably you but it's all different. And even in there, some places, there was a cab driver. They all had suits on. The whole city was completely different. That's how the world saw San Francisco in 1957 when this movie came out. And in the 50s, all of that changed completely. People in San Francisco saw San Francisco as a little different. They relied on Herb Kane, who wrote a column in the San Francisco Chronicle and for a while in the San Francisco Examiner about San Francisco. He came to the city in 1936 from Sacramento and his first big bestseller book came out in 1950, the first of the year, it was called Baghdad by the Bay. Let me read a little bit about what he, how he saw San Francisco. He said, San Francisco to me is like a house of cards, glowing colors stacked against the hills that march of the bay at one side to the Pacific Ocean on the other. The real magic of the city lies in the way these snapshots remain in the mind. No one pressed more sharply on the consciousness than the next. And when I'm far away, the city's myriad details come floating back to me as though they were unwinding endlessly on the movie screen of my mind. Each picture is sharp and complete, glamorized a little by a wisp of fog or a pennant streaming from a skyscraper in the wind. It's a sentimental, corny way to look at a city, but the San Franciscan is hopelessly sentimental and I'm hopelessly San Francisco. To me, my city is Baghdad by the bay. And my mind is lined even cluttered with pictures ranged side by side like this. That's from a, an antique match cover. You know, so long ago that people, businesses gave up matches to light your cigarette with. Nobody has cigarettes anymore, and certainly nobody has matches. This is Playland at the Beach, a uh, amusement park by the sea in San Francisco on a beautiful sunny day. That's typical of the illusion of San Francisco in the 50s. Playland at the Beach in the 40s and 30s, 20s, and early 50s was really charming and nice. Roller coasters and all that sort of stuff. But then it began to outlive its time. And the version of San Francisco with all the pretty pictures kind of did outlive its time because it stopped being like that and it changed. What changed about it? Well, it went out of style. It's like Coney Island, a New York amusement park kind of place. It was, a, it was a great on a sunny day. But as you well know, in San Francisco, there are not too many sunny days off by the ocean beach. The idea of going to an amusement park and riding a roller coaster or going in a fun house or riding on a Ferris wheel was kind of done in by television. You didn't need to do that to abuse yourself. It became, it was, it was cold and foggy most of the time. Uh, its audience is young people and sailors, and soldiers and stuff like that. They all decided to do something else. 
became run down and dangerous. And finally, in the late 50s, it was all torn down. But the memory of it, a kind of nostalgia, still exists as if this were some wonderful part of San Francisco. It's actually an illusion. Most of San Francisco is kind of an illusion of some other better time. But there were lots of other good things in San Francisco then. You know, they had a big literary renaissance. They had homegrown bohemians. They had magazines. They had famous authors, all that kind of stuff photographers, everything. But in the 1950s, the people came from other places like Jack Kerouac, who saw San Francisco as the end of the road, like Frank Sinatra being kicked out of town. He ended up in San Francisco, driving across the Bay Bridge, seeing the city with the fog and the towers, and the skyscrapers on the hill. I thought, this is the place, you know? People like, like Furla Getty, who came here from New York, he had been a seaman and came with a sea bag on his shoulder, walked up Market Street and thought, wow, this is something. Opened a bookstore on Columbus Avenue called City Lights. Autumn of 1955 was a big gathering of all these guys at a gallery called the Sixth Gallery. Uh, actually, it was on Fillmore Street in the marina. And it had a big, huge, giant poetry reading full of poetry and red wine and drunken yellings and stuff like that. Ginsburg read his famous poet poem, Howl, to this audience, screaming and yelling, what a great piece of thing. I see the best minds of my generation who dragged through the streets, that stuff. It was so amazing, it was like electric wires connected. He got a telegram from Furling Geddes saying, I congratulate you at the start of a great career, which is a similar telegram someone he sent to Emerson. He said he would publish that poem. But you know, when you're in a newspaper business, you learn there's two sides to every story. It'd be nice to say that San Francisco embraced these guys. Kerouac is now taught at colleges. Ginsburg is a major poet. And Gary Snyder, another poet of that time, won the Pulitzer Prize. And San Francisco thought they were a menace. They sent cops out to arrest them. Herb Cain made fun of them. He called the Beat Generation Beatniks. And they weren't exactly a Celebrated. Jake changed the way the city was down in the Fillmore district, then the Harlem of the West, right? Got beautiful jazz, all kinds of amazing stuff. But on the other hand, the whole area was a slum and it was cleaned out and all that stuff went away. San Francisco also, you know, a lot of good things happened. Uh, New York Giants couldn't make it in New York, along with the Brooklyn Dodgers moved to the West Coast. And people went around from the East Coast particularly said, well, you know, San Francisco is now major league. Well, we always thought we were major league all the time. So who are you to talk like that? We had this kind of San Francisco narcissism, narcissism about us. Actually, people actually booed Willie Mays because he was a New York guy, not one of our own guys like Joe DiMaggio. Our own homegrown, only homegrown major league team, the 49ers played at Kizar Stadium, which is pretty rough and tough in those days. I mean, a lot of drunks there throwing bottles at the players and all kind of stuff. But when they played at the old All-America Conference, and when the All-America Conference morphed into the NFL, the 49ers weren't quite good enough, or as they said, they weren't big enough or tough enough until later. So San Francisco really, really changed in the 50s. And then as the 50s grew on, the city decided that the city that we had wasn't good enough. They tore down the Western edition. They ripped out half of the six cable car lines. The newspapers merged and folded. Play land at the beach was torn down. The old ferry boats all went away and they put in front of the ferry building the massive Embarcadero freeway gray and black that cut off San Francisco from its waterfront. So the 50s kind of faded away, you know? into something else. That was in the 60s, but that's, you know, another story, as they say. Thank you, San Francisco's own Carl Nolte, reminiscing about San Francisco in the 1950s.
This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.